learn it from global approaches in managing ALL, ALL patients. This module is under title of treatment of ALL in the, in the first line setting, current practice, strategies, outcomes, and key learning. Uh, moreover, I would like to extend my gratitude to the Hematology Medical Society's participating in this meeting through uh, by uh, Emirates Society of Hematology from UAE and Saudi Society for Blood Disorders from Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabian Pediatric Hematology Oncology Society, SAFES from Saudi Arabia. Of course, I have to greet also our guests today from the global experts in ALL care and research network. And let me now to introduce our chairman for this meeting. Next, please. Can you request all the uh, participants to mute their microphones? Sure, sure. Can we shift for the next slide, please? controlling the slides. We have to go. I would like to introduce today our chairman, Dr. Mahmoud Marashi. Dr. Mahmoud Marashi is a consultant hematologist at Dubai Health Authority or DHA and Mediclinic City Hospital. He established the clinical hematology service in Dubai Health Authority. Professor Marashi has been involved in the medical education in the hematology for uh, over 25 years, last 25 years. Also, he's a professor of medicine and hematology, and he is the head of academic department of medicine at Dubai Medical College. He is one of the founding members of Emirates Society of Hematology and the former vice president as well. Dr. Mahmoud, the floor is yours. Welcome, all, everybody, to this uh, uh, session today. We actually are uh, very lucky we have uh, two great speakers and also a great moderator as well. And uh, as you mentioned, what we're going to talk about today is the lessons learned from global approaches in managing ALL patients. We have two modules. The first module will be done today and this will address treatment of ALL in the first line setting. What are the current practice strategies, outcome of uh, Wait. Did we lose him? Yes, we can listen to you. We lost him. You're on mute, Scott. Uh, looks like Mahmoud got disconnected. So should we just move the slide on and um, and he can come back as his connection restores. Um, Faraz, did you want to say a word or two? Uh, you, you, you can go ahead, uh, uh, Professor Scott. Okay, very good. Next slide, please. I think we all know these four people on the slide. And uh, so the first half of this will be my part, uh, which is where do we stand in the management of COVID-19 situation? And uh, this word situation is intentional because uh, it's not just a matter of managing patients who get infected, but of managing the whole health system and all the patients, whether they're infected or not, need special, uh, special consideration during this pandemic. And then Wasa will take over after that. Oh, yeah. Hey, are you back, Mahmoud? Um, I don't know what lost someone. So, uh, well, actually, back. back to yeah, you. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, 
So, Professor Scott Howard, he's actually uh, completed his hematology and oncology training at St. Jude Children's Health Research Hospital. And he, he then worked there as a faculty member for 14 years and treating leukemia and lymphoma and conducting research in oncology and supportive care and also in uh, international oncology and healthcare mm -hmm. informatics. In June 2014, he founded the Resonance, which is an informatics consulting and global health uh, company with a mission to improve care and outcomes in low and middle income countries. He is authored, uh, co-authored 190 scientific papers as well as 15 book chapters. And he presently conducts translational and clinical research. He served. Uh, he serves as Secretary General of the International Pediatric Oncology okay. Society, which promotes childhood cancer care around the world. And he is also Associate Dean for Research in the College of Nursing, University of Tennessee Health Science Center. So we are really privileged to have you here today, and we welcome you to give your presentation. <laughs> Can you please, uh, everybody, can you mute your your screen, please? Down there, there is a mute button. There is a mute button. Professor Scott, carry on, please. Yeah. Very good. Um, can you unshare the slide so that I can share mine, please, dear moderator? I also would like to add my words of thanks to um, to Servier for organizing this meeting, especially Ahmed and uh, Manette uh, from uh, joining us from the Middle East region and from the Paris headquarters. And uh, and thank you, dear moderators. This is really such a pleasure to be with all of you today. And I really hope that we can make this interactive. So the good side of that is that um, we have left all the microphones open uh, so that people can jump in and ask questions or provide comments. And both Wassel and I prefer to jump in in the middle. And if we never share slides, it's okay as long as we're addressing the most important information that is on your mind. But the downside of that is we all have to exercise our own judgment of when to unmute the microphone. So if the dog is barking, then please stay on mute. So I wanted to talk about three things. The first, do no harm. The second is to monitor the health system and adapt as needed. And the third is some COVID-19 specific. So first, do no harm to prevent the patient from relapsing, prevent toxic death from infection, and prevent abandonment of treatment. And I know some of you have seen this paper where we looked at if you have 100 people with cancer in high-income countries, high income down here, 99 get a diagnosis, 97 get a correct diagnosis, 96 start the treatment, 95 don't have a toxic death, 94, uh, and then drops suddenly down to 80%. So the biggest problem here is relapse. And all these other problems are just a, one or two percent of the people have misdiagnosis or non-diagnosis or some other issue like that. But relapse is really what we're fighting against. But if you contrast well, this- uh, We wish to look at your slides also. Ah, uh, you can't see him. No. Oh, thank you for that. All right, I hope that is better. Yes, wonderful. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Okay, great. That's what I mean by jump right in. <laughs> Bless you. So the main problem here is relapse in the high income countries. And you see that if 80% of people with ALL are cured, 15% relapse, and 5% have every other problem. If we contrast that though, in low and middle income countries, all of these other problems are so much more common where a fifth of people don't even get a diagnosis, misdiagnosis, abandonment or no treatment, toxic death. So relapse is a problem, yes, but it's not the main problem. And what is so informative about these low and middle income countries is how they've had to, carefully adapt to try to eliminate these extra causes of treatment failure. And why that is relevant for today's discussion is because even in a high income country, when we have a health system disruption, like from a pandemic, these problems start to reappear. Patients who come way late. I was talking to a friend in Seattle and she said the number of patients they have with acute leukemia who are showing up with hemoglobin of two or three is very common now. 
Whereas before they just had a normal, very rarely would you have a patient in heart failure when they arrive with the acute lymphoblastic leukemia. But because people don't want to leave the house, they don't want to go to their doctor, their doctor office, doctor's office is closed, they end up coming with really bad conditions. So that would be a case of delayed diagnosis. Or they decide to stop treatment for three months and sit in my house. That's the same as abandonment of treatment. So this problem that used to be in, in Africa or you know Mal Malaysia or somewhere, now this is a problem for all of us, not just for the low and middle income countries. So if we imagine a pandemic, you can imagine all these problems can come back to cause trouble and toxic death, of course. What if you have a patient who needs a ventilator, not because of coronavirus, but because they have E. coli sepsis and there's no ventilator for them, they may die of E. coli sepsis when their life would have been saved if they had had a bed in intensive care unit. Of course, the same would be true of wars, embargoes, or any other health system disruption. So when we compare, high income countries here to high income country with a health system disruption, this can start to look a lot like a lower middle income country. And we saw this in Northern Italy, we saw this in Spain, we're now seeing in New York with shortages and problems causing all of these issues. So I wanted to refer us all to the World Health Organization definition of a health system, which is the organizations and the people and the actions whose intent is to promote and maintain, restore and maintain health. So health system disruption means we're disrupting the organizations, hospitals are in trouble. We're disrupting the people, doctors and nurses who are getting sick, having to be quarantined. We're disrupting the actions, importers who want to bring their drug. I uh, just got an email from, uh, from Tawam, from Alain, uh, and they were saying they can't get mercapurine. And now they're trying to buy from Oman to get some shared supply from Oman. So, you know, not having mercaptopurine in the GCC is for me unimaginable, but yet here's a problem which now they have to spend their time in a very busy time trying to find some mercaptopurine to treat the patients. So here is message number one, first do no harm, prevent relapse. Preventing relapse, how do we prevent it? We stay on the protocol, deliver all the therapy, reduce the risk of infection, of course, we know about distancing and masks and gloves and hand washing. And here's the thing though, infections don't just cause toxic death. I'm trying to find a place to put the picture here. Infections can also increase relapse. And think about COVID-19, 98% of cases survive coronavirus infection, but they still have to survive their leukemia after that. So we can't just think of coronavirus, coronavirus, coronavirus. The chance of dying of leukemia is 15% if we do everything right. So the risk of dying of ALL is much higher than the risk of dying of COVID-19 disease, even if you get infected. So staying on the protocol means don't let this relapse get larger and become like this. And so giving the treatment uh, is of course a critical part of this. And let me clear the annotations. So here's a question. How much does COVID-19 increase infectious deaths in cancer patients? And the answer is on the next slide. And it seems to be frozen. So let me try some tricks. So here, let me show you the direct mortality from coronavirus. It is highly age dependent. So age zero to one, risky, up to 1% mortality. Age one to 15, thank goodness for this low mortality rate because a lot of the, you know, uh, all the pediatric patients fall into this group. 16 to 20, uh, 16 to 40, 1% of people. And these are people who already got infected. So when we think of the risk of dying of coronavirus, it's the risk of getting infected times the risk of dying if you get infected. So let's suppose that eventually 100% of us will have been infected. Here's the risk of death from this disease. So when we think about direct mortality, here light blue here is the color of the toxic death right here. 
So for 61 plus, this is substantial. Doc, can you make it uh, uh, full screen, your slides? I can, Difficult to view. It seems to have frozen up on me. Is that better or worse? Yeah, better. Yeah, okay. better. Okay, very good. So you see here that above age um, 61, 5 to 20% of people may die of, of COVID-19 if they get infected. So that the total risk of toxic death in high income countries should be the sum of all these based on the age distribution of the patients and then the risk of death for by each age group. Fortunately, many of our leukemia patients are here in this one to 60 category with really a very low increased mortality from toxic death. And toxic death isn't just from the coronavirus, but also high dose methotrexate or uh, hemorrhage or any other cause or bacteremia. And yesterday, a, a report came in from New York of a patient who was 17, had acute lymphoblastic leukemia, relapsed, and then got admitted to the hospital with E. coli bacteremia, septic shock, and positive for coronavirus. So the question was, that patient died actually of septic shock and multi-organ failure. And people were asking, well, was this a coronavirus death or was this an E. coli death? Uh, and how can we know? And they said they're forced to report to the state as if it were a coronavirus death. But they said the fact is the patient's mother and brother were all positive. All of them had no symptoms. And he had no symptoms of coronavirus. He just had septic shock and organ failure, no respiratory, no upper respiratory. So that's a case where obviously toxic death from E. coli is still a problem. We need the ICU beds available for those patients as well as for the coronavirus patients. And relapse here, gaps in access to essential chemotherapy or gaps in adherence to chemotherapy. If the patient refuses to come for their vincristine pulse during maintenance because they're afraid to come out of the house, then that's a gap in adherence. Or if we tell the patient, hey, come back in three months, we don't wanna risk it, then that's a gap in adherence caused by us. So that's why my main message for tonight is to think about the health system, yes, but think about the individual patient even more. And the individual patient needs to stay on treatment and get everything that they're prescribed. And this would be even at the peak of coronavirus, if you can give the patient their doses, if they can physically arrive to the hospital and get what they need, they should get it. The second thing to talk about is how to adapt when the health system has trouble. And you see here some of the ways the health system can have trouble. And that is, what if our supplier of asparaginase can no longer supply? then we need to go find some new asparaginase. And we might often call up India because India has a lot of companies that make asparaginase. And that would be great normally, but it turns out if you buy native E. coli asparaginase from India, they did a study in Mumbai, they measured 10 different asparaginases uh, that were all, eight of them were produced locally and two of them were imported from other pharma companies importing into India. Eight out of the 10 products had either little activity or no activity whatsoever. So it means if you switch to that asparaginase, you're switching essentially to nothing. So of course, when is the best time to find a new company with a high quality product? It is not during a pandemic because that's the same time it's hard to even get your normal supplier to take care of you. Here's an example from Brazil where they switched from the blue asparaginase to the red asparaginase. And here's a patient who got the previous one the whole time. Here's a patient who switched partway through and here's a patient who got only the new one that was brought in as an emergency purchase. And I'm gonna show it a little bigger. Here's the peak level and the trough for each patient, each dose. So here's dose number one, two, three, four. And here's the level that the asparaginase should be to be effective. So you see that the previous asparaginase in Brazil, Aginasa, was very good. And so the patients who got this should be fine. But here's a patient who was doing fine on the previous one and then on dose number six, switched over to the new one called Luginase. And Luginase, even the peak was not enough to give the minimum amount of asparaginase necessary. Um, here's just another larger example. So the peak level was still not even enough. And of course the trough was almost undetectable. So the Luginase was not, a, it's not a, totally inactive, but it was so inactive that it really would not be of benefit to the patient. Here's a larger view peak and trough. And here's a very large view. You see that many of the doses, even the very peak level was totally useless. 
So we all know about physical distancing, mask, gloves, hand washing, avoiding bringing patients for unnecessary things. So here is my third and final point, which is there are some things we do every day that we never should have been doing, that never were necessary. And so here's our chance to quit doing those things forever, not just during a pandemic. So for example, a bone marrow evaluation after achieving remission. If a patient is MRD negative, they should never have another bone marrow unless there's a risk of relapse. It's not necessary. Multiple studies show the, the lack of utility of screening an MRD negative person. If the MRD turns positive, don't worry. A month later, they'll be in frank relapse and you can treat the relapse at that point. But otherwise you'd have to do a bone marrow every couple of weeks to really detect that relapse at a very early stage. And nobody ever showed that that early stage detection would even help the patient's prognosis. So this is a great example of a wasteful, useless, unnecessary practice that still is hanging around in some protocols. We should get rid of this practice immediately and never bring it back. Once the coronavirus is gone, hopefully the bone marrow evaluation after remission will stay gone. One exception. If the patient is in morphologic remission, but MRD positive, of course they need another bone marrow. So the time to quit repeating it is once they've achieved MRD negative remission, not just morphologic remission. So when I say remission, I mean undetectable leukemia, quit trying to detect it after that. A blood count after going off therapy, <laughs> even a blood count. How many of us get a blood count in all of our off therapy patients whenever they come? Turns out it's a total waste of time. If they're relapsing, they'll be clinically relapsing. So either we have to get a blood count weekly to pick up that relapse a few weeks early or don't bother at all. So again, a wasteful practice. In-person visits for off therapy. We have a technology, I'm gonna show you here, this technology right here, it's a phone. And that patient who does not need a blood count, does not need a physical exam, doesn't need anything. So they can just phone up, discuss how they're doing, answer any questions, and proceed from there, unless they have a known late side effect. And then continuing the things that are necessary to save that patient's life, IT therapy, chemotherapy, et cetera. So I wanna close with an invitation, which is right now we are discussing these two yellow boxes. That's us right here, right now, which is uh, this group meeting to discuss leukemia patients in, and handling an acute problem of the health system. But there's another meeting that's happening every week on Friday uh, at 8 a.m. Memphis time, which is uh, 4 p.m. Saudi Arabia, 5 p.m. Uh, for most of the other countries. So you are very welcome to come to this meeting if possible. We've been meeting weekly uh, for a while, and then we'll go back to once a month eventually. But um, you are super welcome to that meeting. It's already been going for a while. And the sessions are recorded, so if you're not in the mood on Friday evening to come to an online session, then um, please just click here on amplifyinghealth.com slash education, and you can uh, download this or play it at your own spare time on the weekend. But here's one of the examples. Um, this has experts from all over the world, uh, ALL experts and infectious disease experts, and here's just some of the information presented yesterday. This will be online on Monday, and you can go check. There's also uh, web pages with additional guidance, AYA, COVID, AYA, cancer.org. So very specific uh, advice and guidance uh, provided by experts, pediatric and adult hematologists. So I would welcome you to that group and I would welcome you to watch the, um, the videos there. Uh, this recording will also go on that same site if you want to review later. There are many registries that we could talk about. I don't know if you guys already have your own registry but if you do, I wanted to mention one issue, which is when people get more and more information systems, it becomes impossible to maintain them. So imagine we have all of these information systems, medical record, administrative, financial, research, clinical, and then somebody says, hey, let's do a cancer registry. It sounds like a great idea, but it's extra work. And then somebody else says, well, let's do a high dose methotrexate registry. Some of you are participating with me on that high dose methotrexate registry. Then somebody else says, let's do a COVID-19 registry. And somebody else says, let's do some other stuff. So in the end, now we have all of these clinical systems and information systems, plus four more, it's too much. So I would like to try to discuss how we can condense all these into a single system for greater efficiency where we can have our COVID-19 registry, but it's integrated here. So it's a minimal burden of additional data collection. 
Uh, so the proposal would be to integrate our COVID-19 registry with the cancer registry and other types of clinical projects. So if you can't wait till next week, uh, then email me and I'll just describe what's going on there. Finally, the how we're gonna beat coronavirus and every future challenge is by having close networks like the one we are on today, gathering with our friends and colleagues to educate each other, to do research together, to support clinical care together. And the ALL Research and Care Network is doing all three of those activities. So if you wanna join, let me know and we can add you to the invitation list. So now I would like to turn it over to Wasil Justinaya. You know him very well and I will stop sharing. Also, the questions in the chat I see have now added up to a lot. Um, so don't forget, there's a May 2nd meeting continuing this discussion. There is um, uh, a lot of advice about improving the sound. <laughs> and um, I think we'll try to do that. And I don't see any specific questions about ALL, but uh, Wasil, I will monitor the questions while you share your talk. Actually, we will be doing the questions at the end, question answers later. I think now Dr. Wassil Jastanya will, will be talking now uh, on the uh, regional approaches to optimize ALL patient care with and without uh, pandemic. So Dr. Wassil, uh, he is a consultant pediatric hematology oncology and bone marrow transplant uh, uh, physician. He's a professor at the College of Medicine, Umbul Kura University in Makkah, and uh, he is the chairman of the Princess Nora, uh, Princess Nora Oncology Center in King Abdul Aziz Medical City. He's, he obtained his medical degree from King Saud University in Riyadh, and he then gained board certification in pediatrics and pediatric hematology oncology from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics. He has won numerous awards and distinctions. He is a member of multiple national and international societies and member of the editorial board of Pediatric Hematology Oncology Journal. He served as reviewer of multiple international journals and he has got many publications in the field of pediatric hematology oncology. And he's also a speaker at many congresses. So I welcome Wasil Jastanya to, to his presentation now. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So uh, first of all, I'd like to take this uh, opportunity to uh, uh, wish everybody a, a Ramadan Mubarak in the region and to thank uh, Servier for uh, organizing this event. Uh, it's always uh, challenging to follow uh, Sir Scott, uh, but I'll do my best here. Uh, so my talk is about regional approaches to optimize ALO uh, patient care with and without a uh, pandemic. And to address, uh, to address uh, optimizing uh, patient care with a pandemic, we need to look first at uh, optimizing care without a pandemic, as during a pandemic, healthcare systems are put under the test, uh, magnifying old uh, challenges uh, that are pre-existing in addition to uh, new emerging uh, challenges. So, so the goal uh, of optimizing care is to raise the cancer trajectory curve so that more patients are surviving, uh, which requires uh, timely interventions starting with uh, access to care, followed by diagnostic resolution, and then treatment, which includes uh, access, adherence, and completing treatment. And uh, finally, supportive care, which is a broad continuous process that includes uh, supportive uh, infrastructure, supportive medication, and integrated care. And what I'll do in this presentation is I'll highlight uh, the importance of uh, these factors in improving the cancer trajectory curve uh, by, sele uh, by, selected, by presenting selected regional and global studies pertaining uh, mainly to uh, ALL. So first, uh, access to care. Uh, this is a, a simple uh, study that we did in our institution uh, at Princess Noor Oncology Center, looking at turnaround times of uh, processing referrals. Excuse me, Prof. Prof, your slides are not being seen since the beginning. Only your first introductory slide is there on. Okay, let me stop sharing and share again.
Yeah, you may kindly go back to your first slide so that we can be introduced to your. Can you see my slides now? Yeah, very well. Thank you. All right, so I'll go back again. Uh, so the to, to, I don't know if you saw the first one, which is the most important one. <laughs> Uh, this is the conclusion of my talk. So uh, to address optimizing uh, care uh, in a pandemic, we need to uh, first look at uh, optimizing care without a pandemic. As during a pandemic, uh, healthcare systems are uh, put under uh, the test and the magnifying uh, pre-existing challenges uh, in addition to uh, new challenges. Uh, so uh, the goal of optimizing care is really to raise this uh, cancer trajectory curve so that more patients are surviving. And uh, this needs uh, timely intervention, uh, interventions uh, starting with access to care, diagnostic resolution, and treatment, whether it's access to treatment, adherence to treatment, and completing treatment, in addition to uh, supportive care. And uh, in this presentation, I'll highlight the importance of these factors uh, in the cancer trajectory by presenting selected regional and global uh, studies that pertain to ALL in the most part. So this, uh, in, in highlighting access to care, this is a, a single center study done by our group, uh, looking at turnaround times of uh, processing referrals from uh, community centers and private hospitals in, uh, in, in, in the region. Uh, to the Princess Noura Oncology Center in our hospital. So from January uh, to December 2015, we had uh, 185 uh, pediatric cancer referrals accepted by our center, of which 11 had uh, early deaths. And early death was defined as uh, death from the time of uh, initiating the uh, referral from the referring center uh, to the uh, time of discharge from the first admission or contact to our hospital. And the turnaround times of the processing uh, of the referrals for patients that died was, as you see here, was significantly longer than uh, patients uh, that were uh, alive uh, and had no early death events. So this uh, led us to uh, initiate a project to improve uh, the turnaround processing of referrals so that timely access to care can be put in place. And we initiated this back in uh, uh, January 2015, where we uh, developed a online web-based electronic referral system uh, as an improvement project. And we conducted this uh, impact study, uh, which stands for improving access to care. Uh, and we compared the processing uh, turnaround times in the 12 months before introducing the uh, electronic referral system, which we called the manual referral system, where pa patients uh, or hospitals fa faxed papers manually and they were processed manually, compared to uh, improving communication and improving turnaround times for processing in the electronic referral system. And what we found is that uh, uh, the turnaround times uh, in the electronic uh, referral system uh, was significantly improved and no early deaths were observed in the 12 months uh, following the introduction of uh, the electronic referral system, implying that uh, improving timely access to care by improving turnaround times of uh, uh, referral processing improves uh, patient uh, outcomes. So the other uh, aspect is uh, access uh, to treatment. And uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, study that was uh, conducted uh, uh, recently, uh, two years ago. And it was a cross-sectional web-based survey to pediatric oncologists uh, registered on the Cure for Kids uh, web portal. And as you can see, it's a colorful map. Uh, so patients that are in, uh, so uh, countries that are in green had ideal access uh, to the essential medication list uh, as uh, listed by the WHO. Uh, where, and, and ideal meant that uh, these countries had 95% uh, or more uh, access to the essential medication list for children with cancer. Uh, yellow meant uh, 80, 80 to 95% access to essential medication list, and orange was suboptimal, uh, meaning 60 to 80%, and red was uh, poor access to the essential medication list. And as you can see here, 
uh, even in high income countries, uh, there was a difference in uh, access to essential medications for childhood cancer. And uh, this at a global level, the effect of a pandemic is expected to magnify the uh, access to essential medication list uh, depending on the baseline access for each country. So it hits different countries at uh, different uh, levels. Uh, the impact of chemotherapy shortage has also been reported uh, for patients on clinical trials. And this is a report from the Children's Oncology Group uh, where they uh, surveyed uh, uh, principal investigators and pharmacists two years uh, prior to the uh, publication of this paper. Uh, on uh, uh, impact of uh, chemotherapy shortages. And as you can see, uh, medications that uh, were in, in, short, uh, were sh in shortage, uh, even in clinical trials, uh, included the main uh, medications that are used in ALL uh, as well. So to address uh, chemotherapy shortages in Saudi Arabia, we conducted a survey and a workshop last year as part of the annual patient safety forum conducted by our institution. And this was led by a talented uh, clinical pharmacist uh, in our hospital, uh, Dr. Aisha Al Azmi. Uh, uh, who, and what we did is that we sent surveys uh, for uh, physicians in the region and uh, healthcare providers in the region uh, to uh, ask about uh, cancer treatment shortages in different centers. And as you can see, all respondents from cancer centers in Saudi Arabia reported that cancer treatment shortages constituted a current problem in their uh, center with an average of five uh, per month. And management uh, decisions for sh sudden medication shortages uh, were reported as uh, uh, choosing an alternative optimal or suboptimal medication in 48%, uh, transferring the patient to another institution, whether nationally or internationally, uh, in 38%, which can be a problem uh, during city lockdowns, and 7% reported delay or cancellation of the cycle of therapy, and 7% uh, as an out-of-pocket patient cost to bring their own uh, medication uh, to the uh, center. The impact of medication shortage uh, was reported as death in 2% as identified by a root cause analysis as readmission and prolonged hospitalization in 5%, cancellation of treatment in 11%, treatment failure as evidenced by relapse or progression in 18%, and increased monitoring with or without hospitalization in 31%, and associated with uh, decreased, decreased uh, patient uh, satisfaction in uh, 33%. A single center study from New York uh, similarly uh, reported the impact of uh, unplanned treatment changes due to chemotherapy shortage. And it showed that the uh, alternative was associated with uh, inferior efficacy in 30% and greater toxicity in uh, approximately uh, 35%. Another important uh, observation that we learned from the national survey uh, in Saudi Arabia is that the, uh, is the ethical challenges in decision making when you have uh, drug shortages. And as you can see from this figure, uh, there was no existing ethical framework for practitioners. Uh, so you have some that reported that they will treat the sickest patient with the available drug first. Other, others reported that uh, they'll treat uh, those with curative intent rather than palliative intent. Uh, some uh, said first come, first served, and so on. So uh, this highlights the ethical dilemmas and challenges and are important to address even more today with the magnified uh, shortages that could happen during a uh, pandemic. So at the end, after uh, the survey was completed, we uh, convened as an expert panel. And this expert panel uh, consisted of healthcare practitioners from different disciplines, physicians, uh, pharmacists, and uh, nurses, in, in addition to hospital administrators, and representatives from authorities and regulatory bodies, including the Saudi FDA and the National uh, Procurement uh, Agency in addition to presidents or vice presidents of different societies and ph pharmaceutical companies, including wholesalers, uh, national and international manufacturers, and uh, medicine supply chain. And we came up with uh, eight uh, challenges 
and uh, uh, nine recommendations, which are uh, more, even more important uh, to implement uh, today during a pandemic uh, than ever. So uh, another uh, challenge is uh, adherence uh, to uh, treatment. As uh, Scott mentioned, uh, poor adherence can significantly impact uh, outcomes. And a very good example of this is what we learned uh, from the uh, COG 6MP, 6 mecaptopurine uh, COG study. And in this study, uh, they evaluated the impact of adherence on uh, relapse outcomes and patients were monitored using a smart bottle uh, that was linked to a medication event report monitoring system uh, that recorded uh, the adherence rate over a six month period. And as you can see on the figure in the left, uh, as, as, as per uh, uh, usual human behavior, uh, compliance and adherence uh, really declines over time and it was significantly declined over the six months where patients were uh, monitored. And when they looked at uh, the impact of this adherence on outcome, as shown in the figure on the right, uh, they showed that patients that had less than 95% adherence to daily 6 mercaptopurine had a uh, significantly increased risk of uh, relapse at four years compared to those that uh, were uh, uh, adherent 95 or more uh, percent of the time. This means that in a 28-day, uh, four-week maintenance course, missing more than two days of treatment is associated with a uh, four-fold uh, increase in the risk of relapse uh, at uh, four years. And after adjusting for prognostic factors, this was still true with a 2.5-fold increase in the cumulative incidence of relapse at four years. And what was also important is that uh, with declining uh, adherence, uh, there was a progressive increase in the uh, risk of relapse with patients uh, less than 85% adherent to the daily 6MP dose having a hazard ratio of uh, 5.7. So uh, this is, uh, in, in practice, uh, poor adherence can be related to patient and or uh, prescriber related behaviors which again can be uh, magnified uh, during a uh, pandemic uh, for uh, different uh, reasons. So the other important uh, aspect of treatment is actually completing treatment. And a good example is the recently published uh, Children's Oncology Group uh, study that looked at uh, an important component of ALL therapy, which is uh, asparaginase. And in this study, uh, they, followed, uh, they looked at uh, the disease-free survival of patients that uh, received all PEG asparaginase doses here in green, uh, patients that were switched to Arrhenia asparaginase uh, due to hypersensitivity, but also received all their asparaginase uh, doses in uh, blue, uh, compared to uh, those uh, that missed asparaginase doses in the red uh, dashed line. And what they uh, reported is that NCI high-risk patients who did not receive all asparaginase doses had a significantly uh, inferior disease-free survival as shown in this figure. And also uh, asparaginase discontinuation associated with a 50% increase in the hazard of an event among both uh, NCI high-risk and NCI standard-risk patients with uh, slow early response. And this highlights uh, the importance of completing therapy and the negative impact of omitting uh, therapy on disease outcome. Uh, therefore, dis decisions on omitting therapy need to be really carefully studied uh, based on evidence-based and objective uh, measures weighing both the risk and the benefit of uh, making these uh, decisions and planning uh, the course uh, of therapy, particularly during a uh, pandemic. So the last uh, factor that I will be highlighting is the importance of supportive care on improving the uh, cancer trajectory. And supportive care uh, is a continuous process and involves not only supportive medications, but also uh, supportive uh, infrastructure. And to highlight this, I give an example from uh, our local experience in treating ALL at the Princess Noura Oncology Center where a number of improvements in supportive uh, infrastructure and treatment stratification were introduced over three time periods as shown here. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, in this study, the improvements over the different time periods were studied using the uh, framework of the medical care scare scale developed by the uh, Pediatric Oncology in Developing Countries Committee of the CEOP uh, that characterized uh, the level of care uh, and improvements in infrastructure uh, and in diagnostic and treatment, in addition to many other uh, aspects uh, of care. And the care scale uh, in this uh, framework ranged from level zero, uh, which is pilot treatments, to level four, which is state-of-the-art uh, treatment. And I know you cannot see the numbers, but uh, uh, from uh, period one to period four, there was an increasing number of uh, level of care uh, during this period. And this associated with a progressive improvement in the overall survival when you look at the uh, overall survival graph here from uh, period one, which was 1989 to 2000, to period three, which was uh, 2008 to 2014. And in the last period, the overall survival uh, approached or uh, reached the, the level of uh, the estimated overall survivals uh, in the uh, recent uh, children's oncology group uh, studies. And uh, the, the relative risk reduction of death uh, in, in period three compared to period, period one was approximately 60% uh, for, uh, when comparing these uh, two periods. And on sub-analysis, uh, the most significant percent relative risk reduction in death was in uh, death from disease uh, after induction. And this indicated the impact of uh, improved diagnostics, improved treatment stratification, and approved adherence to protocol therapy in period three, as we conducted an MRD-based uh, prospective clinical trial protocol uh, in, uh, in this phase, uh, injecting that clinical trial-based culture in our system. A greater improvement over time was observed uh, in T-cell ALL, as so shown in this figure. And when we did the sub-analysis on the causes of uh, treatment failure and the improvement, we saw that uh, the improvements uh, were, were result, a result of reduction in both toxic deaths and the re disease related deaths, which uh, indicated improvement in uh, supportive care and in uh, the treatment uh, delivery system. So, uh, based on these studies and uh, other studies from the uh, region, uh, we had an uh, advisory board uh, that we uh, uh, gathered uh, national pediatric ALL experts from different centers in Saudi Arabia with uh, Professor Scott as our uh, friend and advisor and highlighted uh, a number of unmet needs. And these were the unmet needs that were highlighted uh, for ALL care in the region. The first was access to care, although it was improving, there were still some rooms to, uh, for improvement in the, uh, in, at the national level. Access to diagnostics, including minimal residual disease, molecular stratification, and therapeutic drug monitoring, such as asparaginase activity and PPMT and NOT15 testing, was uh, uh, lacking in a um, uh, majority of centers, if not all. And access to therapeutics, uh, particularly novel therapies, and uh, uh, therapies uh, introduced in clinical trials were also unmet needs, and standardization to improve equal access to uh, competent standard care, and collaborative research studies were uh, some of the uh, highlighted unmet needs. And to address these unmet needs, we put uh, together uh, proposed action plans that are shown here. Uh, and before I end my presentation to address the optimization of care with a pandemic, I would appreciate if uh, the group and audience can answer the following questions by voting uh, yes or no. So the first question I'd like to ask is, uh, did you or do you have a pediatric cancer patient, pediatric meaning less than 15 years of age, diagnosed with a confirmed COVID-19 positive infection uh, in your center? So uh, can you please uh, vote? You have the poll here. Please vote yes or no. Okay, so 7% uh, 
uh, of uh, people from all over the globe are saying uh, yes, but majority, 93%, uh, 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 did not uh, have a, pa a cancer patient with uh, uh, COVID-19 positive disease. So the, the next uh, question. And uh, also, you can erase that yellow line uh, by clicking on some button while they're answering, while we're answering. <laughs> I don't know where's the button, though. <laughs> Only the presenter can see it. I'll try and find it. <laughs> yeah, there we go. I just learned today, <laughs> just now. I think somebody uh, else is drawing it for me. Yeah, can I, can I introduce uh, Dr. Wasil? Can I introduce Dr. Wasil, uh, uh, Dr. Firas Alfre? Uh, he will be moderating the session. And, uh, he is the president of Saudi Society of Blood Disorders and director of alternate stem cell donor program at the uh, King Faisal Hospital and Research Center in Riyadh. Uh, he gained his medical degree at the College of uh, Medicine, King Saud University, and later joined the Princess Margaret Center in Toronto where he completed adult hematology training. Uh, he's a member of several international organizations as well as national, and he's a journal reviewer for several journals. So I welcome him to moderate this session. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Marsh. Um, thank, thank you, Prof. Justini and Prof. Howard for an excellent talk. Uh, so we'll, we'll open the floor now for questions, uh, Q and A. I, I, saw, I saw a few questions I think already addressed by Dr. Howard, uh, but I'll, I'll ask, I'll, there is one question for Dr. Howard regarding COVID-19 and ALL. Mm -hmm. So uh, would, you, would you recommend using more targeted therapy during uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, or novel agents uh, in comparison to less uh, standard chemotherapy? Yeah, Wasil, would you like to take that first? Uh, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Uh, should I we was be trying switching to, to... The yellow line. <laughs> yeah, that yellow line is really <laughs> distracting. Uh, the question was, would we switch to some targeted therapies to maybe not be so immunosuppressive during a pandemic like this? I think that's a part of the question, uh, but uh, I think the message uh, is uh, to stick to uh, standard therapy because we know the outcomes from uh, standard therapy and we know that it works and gives a, a good uh, uh, event in overall survival. So I wouldn't change uh, uh, as a preventative measure to reduce risk of infection uh, to uh, immunotherapies uh, at this point. And, and I thought we were going to be able to have a great argument, but we have exactly the same opinion. So that is the number one message of today, which is stick to the treatment. If, you, if there's any way to do it, stick to the base treatment. In the text while you were talking, Wasil, a number of people asked about maintenance therapy, patients who can't come in, who can't make it for vincristine pulse and things like that. And so in that case, um, several people had a great idea, which is just keep going with the 6-MP and methotrexate and then bring them for their vincristine pulse as soon as they are able to come back, then bring them. And I think that is brilliant. That is the perfect strategy. And it's funny because that's what the low-income country people have been having to do for decades because maybe they don't have vincristine that day. So suddenly they have to figure out a way to keep that patient in remission until they can get some vincristine. And the answer is don't just do nothing. Instead, give the maintenance. And the same would be true of anything you have to get rid of, like if they need a high-dose methotrexate and all the beds are full, then you can just trade and bring forward a block of maintenance or, or some other block that is feasible and then put that methotrexate back a little bit later as soon as you can do it to make it up. So every patient, even if they can't get the full protocol exactly as written, if they get the blocks shifted around instead of ABC, it might be ACB, 
for logistical reasons or feasibility reasons, then that's okay. As long as we're not going A and then a big pause and then B and then a big pause and then C, those are the patients who will really have a super high risk of relapse. And uh, you saw what happened just when they skip six mercaptopurine, even just one dose out of 20 is causes more relapse. So you can imagine if you skip a whole month, you know, how, how much trouble we could be in. Um, uh, thank you, thank you, Prof. Uh, so there is a, another question from Dr. Hawazin. Uh, she's asking, does the immunosuppressant medication that we are giving reduce the, uh, the incidence of severe COVID-19? Um, I think she's referring that uh, the risk of cytokine release syndrome will be less uh, for those who are, who are in chemo. Scott, you want to take that? Uh, I think we just no, global, neither do you. <laughs> <the global. laughs> no, this, this is a great question. And uh, I think, I hope everyone can come back next week because next week we're going to really go into extreme detail about treating a patient during, if they have an inf active infection, symptomatic infection. If they have asymptomatic infection, I'm, I'll just give you the one minute uh, teaser so that you'll want to come back next week. But asymptomatic, just virus positive, but no symptoms then most people recommend hold the chemotherapy for at least a week, make sure they're still fine a week later, and then resume light chemotherapy and slowly add back. So for example, if they're in induction, people would say, I'm just gonna give steroids and vincristine, I'm gonna hold the asparaginase, hold the anthracycline, and make sure they don't progress any worse. If they start to progress, it actually may be protective, just like you just like you said, because it may be reducing the cytokine storm. But what we're going to see next week is that the timing of each intervention during a COVID-19 disease is critical. There's a period where there's virus and no immune response, and then there's a period of immune response, and then there's a period where there may be way too much immune response, and that's the patient who lands in the intensive care unit. And the intervention at each of these three critical phases could be radically different. And so there are right now studies of IL-6 blockade, for example, studies of hydroxychloroquine, zinc, high dose vitamin C, so many things are being studied and reported before the study is mature. So we're gonna discuss the details of that next week, but I think this is a critical question, super important question, and that's why we dedicate a whole half hour to it next time. Okay, uh, I have a question for us. Yes, please. Yes, uh, my name is Muhammad Bayoumi. Uh, the questions for uh, Prof. Uh, uh, Scott regarding, uh, do you know, we are facing uh, the blood product uh, donation and we have a shortage of the bag red blood cells and platelets. And some relapsed patients we elect before to use, like for example, high dose RC flag or whatever to keep to put the patient in remission or the patient who is in remission would like to give them a second cycle of flag to keep him in, uh, in, uh, in MRD negative to, uh, as a bridge for transplant. Uh, at the same time, we, with this blood product uh, 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 shortage, using blinatumumab, is it an option? It's an expensive medications. And uh, uh, we, we face this issue uh, during uh, this crisis? Yeah, that is a great question now. And I appreciate you asking it because of course we're all asking in our mind. So in this case, I think if this is a, a B lineage ALL patient in relapse, linitumumab probably would, have, would be the preferred treatment anyway. And so that's a case where back to our original message, which is do what you would have done anyway, if there's any way you can possibly make it happen. So this is a case where if you could have had the blinatumumab anyway, then for sure this would be a great time to bring it because uh, it's highly immunosuppressive though. I have to tell you, it's, it's not going to reduce the risk of, of coronavirus infection, but it certainly will not need blood products. And so when you're dealing with a very specific kind of shortage, the, the problem is, uh, Mohammed, that this question, normally the people who can't get blinatumumab 
are, are, are normally the people who have trouble with blood products are practicing in places where they would never have glenotumumab. You know, if you're in Malawi, you have trouble with blood products, but you have trouble with everything else because the health system is so impoverished. So the trouble is nobody's ever studied these very selective, I'm just missing this one thing, which is my blood bank, because I can't get the volunteers to come there but I do have glenotumumab. So in this case, I, I, this was come back got to the targeted question. I would say targeted therapies that do not require transfusion are the perfect substitute when you don't have blood products. And so in a way, I'll reverse our uh, shared answer to the first question by saying special exception, if you can't transfuse a patient and you're about to give an AML type block, that patient's gonna need transfusion or they could die of hemorrhage. So I, I love your idea, which is you gotta stay flexible and you gotta think, why am I doing this substitution? I'm not doing it to reduce immunosuppression because that's gonna be immunosuppressed like crazy. I'm doing it to produce myelosuppression so they don't need a blood product. So in this case, I would agree to, to make the switch. Wasi, well, what do you think? Uh, and everybody, what do you think? Please type your comments in the comment section. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we have we have another question. Um, uh, <clears throat> maybe one before Russell. What, what do you think about the use of uh, anti CD twenty uh, uh, during COVID pandemic? There are some recommendation on lymphoma actually to try to minimize the use as much as possible. What do you think on ALL? Yeah, so. Uh, in pediatric ALL, uh, the standard uh, does not in include uh, rituximab or, or anti-CD20 uh, targeted therapies uh, in first-line uh, therapy. So uh, I, I think uh, from a pediatric uh, ALL uh, expert, I wouldn't uh, use it uh, because that's not the standard of care uh, regardless. Okay. Um. Another question is regarding uh, postponing uh, intrathecal uh, chemotherapy uh, for maintenance. Would you give it now or reschedule it? Okay, so uh, rescheduling by uh, shifting it for, uh, during maintenance by shifting it for uh, the next cycle or a couple of weeks, that's uh, not an uncommon practice that we do even without the pandemic because of social reasons and others, as long as you stick to the uh, number of intrathecals that are prescribed uh, during the uh, maintenance. So I wouldn't do too many changes, but if there is a uh, uh, city lockdown or some changes that uh, uh, prevent the patient from coming, then rescheduling that uh, intrathecal uh, and not omitting it uh, is probably the way to go. Uh, another question is regarding timing for pomoral transplant. Uh, if you have a patient with a, uh, with a clear indication for transplant, would you consider delaying it by giving more chemo or you would proceed for transplant? Okay, me or Scott? You, for sure. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, that's so, such uh, a difficult situation. Again, it depends on... Uh, the context of uh, the situation. So if it's uh, somebody that is an induction failure, you're having a problem putting this patient into remission and you just got him into remission. So he's, uh, this, this kind of patient is a high risk uh, patient that I would uh, probably prioritize uh, uh, lining up transplant uh, if possible. Uh, however, if there are uh, uh, obstacles in uh, doing transplant, whether uh, it's the donor availability, logistics, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, then again, uh, giving an immune therapy in that context uh, as a hold on or a bridge uh, to transplant is probably a, a, a good option. Uh, in, in a uh, relapsed setting where you uh, uh, have options of giving one, two, or three cycles, then I would time it uh, based on you know, the second part of the presentation I couldn't complete, but based on where, are, where is your country, city, and hospital uh, is in the pandemic curve? Are you at the beginning of the pandemic curve uh, or at the crisis with everything is locked down or in the aftermath uh, part? So I think uh, it's a case-by-case -case decision that uh, needs to take into account uh, multiple factors that not only include your country, but your city and your uh, hospital, because you'll find some variability on how some hospitals can function compared to others during a pandemic. 
would you guys inter be interested in having extended sessions after the two initial sessions where we discuss actually specific cases? Because I, I think what you just said, case by case, this applies to many different things that I don't think we really have time for even today and next week. But uh, It would be a great idea. Yeah, I think it could be really helpful. And we can maybe hear more from audience members about things they've already done. I see so many creative solutions in the chat area that there's so much experience here. Okay. So, well, uh, thank you, Russell. So we'll have two more questions, uh, maybe because of the time. So there, there are a couple of questions regarding management of ALL patient who developed COVID-19. Will there be anything different? So there was a, um, a reference for, will you use IVIG? Will you use a convalescent plasma? Uh, Prof. Scott? Yeah, I would have to say controversial. Every treatment that is recommended is controversial. If uh, IVIG, I was just arguing with somebody about how could IVIG help? There's no way the, the immunoglobulin in that vial has any anti-coronavirus immunoglobulin because it's a new infection. So there is no herd immunity unless we make some IVIG today and maybe we'd have some people contributing that antibody. But then the, the counter argument was no, IVIG is an immunoglobulin modulator and may decrease the cytokine storm and have some other effects. I have no idea. And in the United States, there's currently shortage of IVIG. So everybody's saving it only for proven indications. There's not even enough for proven indications like post-transplant or post uh, you know, hypoglomaglobinemia. So in that case, I, I would not recommend IVIG unless you just have extra lying around and no use for it. But um, as far as which treatments to use, I think um, we probably have to defer that to next week. But if you have hyperimmune, hyperimmune globulin made from patients who recovered, then that's a different thing. That's getting a randomized trial right now, uh, one in Philadelphia and one in um, Colorado, one for adults and one for peds. But again, I, I should tell everybody just throwing in some treatment because maybe it doesn't do any harm is probably not recommended. And it, in the SARS epidemic uh, outbreak, uh, like a, a while back, there were eight medicines just as promising as hydroxychloroquine, just as promising as remdesivir, just as promising as hyperimmune globulin, and zero out of eight turned out to be helpful when they finally finished the randomized trial. And several of them actually increased toxicity. So I, I would not recommend just throwing in treatments that are in the newspaper uh, until we get some data. And right now, there's no data to really strongly support any of the things that are done. So I think supportive care would be the recommendation for this week. Maybe next week, some of that data will appear. Okay. Uh, last, last question, uh, Prof. Howard, is do you screen patients who are going for transplant, patients and donors uh, for COVID, even if they are asymptomatic? Oh, yes, definitely. So while an ALL patient who's asymptomatic, maybe the treatment wouldn't be so different, but imagine transplanting. It, it takes uh, in a in a normal host, an immunocompetent host, they'll usually be shedding virus for about 21 days. So this 14-day quarantine, they're supposed to be checked again after the 14 days. A handful might be negative, but really the vast majority of people are still shedding virus at 14 days. And so then 21 days typically turning negative. So they have to typically, at least in Tennessee, what we're doing now is they get their 14-day check. Unfortunately, the rule of the state is they have to stay another 14 days when it tests positive. But now imagine you're going into transplant plant with active viremia and then you're getting the the donor immune system it's going to actually tolerate so that it'll then tolerate the virus it'd probably be a big disaster to my knowledge nobody's tried it uh, unless it was an accident of course getting a new infection is also terrible so transplant i feel like it's a rock and a hard place right now what to do for patients who need urgent transplant if it's a, like an aplastic anemia patient or something anybody that could be deferred of course, we should defer. But if it's a relapsed leukemia, you can't, you can't really wait. So family, the donor has to be negative, the recipient has to be negative, and ideally, if there's any family member positive, send them away you know, to stay somewhere else uh, because the risk, of course, would be extreme. Great, great question. 
So by, by this, we will reach the, to the end of the, this webinar. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Justinia and Professor uh, Howard, as well as Professor uh, Mohammed. Uh, special thanks for all the attendees. Uh, and special thanks to Sylvia for, uh, provide, for supporting uh, such uh, educational activity. We hope to see you next week at the same time, using the same link for more uh, interesting talks by our uh, speakers. Thank you. Jazila and dear chairs and colleagues. Thanks, Russell. Thanks, uh, Prof. Scott. Thank you again. Bye. Bye.